Hi students, welcome to Science Extension and Module 1, The Foundations of Scientific Thinking. We're now into Video 5 and we're going to focus on Popperian falsifiability. The learning intention for this video is for you to analyse the importance of falsifiability in scientific research. The plan is to introduce Karl Popper's theory of falsifiability, to link falsifiability with hypothesis testing and to also ask the question why is a null hypothesis important? And then to briefly look at some of the critiques of falsification and when is good science not falsifiable. So let's get into it. As always, I'm trying to give you an idea of some of the sources that have contributed to the development of this video. I should also point out that there's a number of other sources, including resources from the DET and a number of other teachers who've contributed to a general drive. And there's lots of great material in there. And I have taken some of that material to help inform both the notes that go with the videos and also these videos themselves. We continue to recommend what is this thing called science because I think it's a great overview of a lot of what's going on. A smaller version of that is philosophy of science, a very short introduction. And of course, you can't talk about falsifiability without mentioning Popper's uh, terrific book, The Logic of uh, Scientific Discovery. And I actually have a copy of that myself here with plenty of little sticky notes in there that I've uh, been putting in as I've read through it. So here's some of the material as well as a nice little article there summarising some of the information that was used to help verify Einstein's ideas, a nice little uh, series of book reviews. And there's plenty more material to look at. And I think that's one of the takeaway messages from these videos. Uh, is there just a taster? I know some of them are running to 20 or 30 minutes, but they are just a bit of an idea. And that's what philosophy is about. It's about trying to present some ideas, get you thinking about what science is, about how we define it, how different people have defined science and how people have done science uh, throughout history and what we can conclude from some of the things that they've done. So let's look at falsifiability. Falsifiability is just another reasoning tool used in science. The word falsifiability refers to the practice of disproving ideas. And this is contrary to the common notion that science is actually trying to find the truth or prove the truth of its ideas. Falsifiability is based on the philosophy of skepticism. And as you'll see if you study any of Popper's work, he was very much against inductive reasoning and so falsifiability is a form of deductive reasoning. According to skepticism, truth and certainty of knowledge are not attainable by humans. Instead, by being critical and skeptical, it's possible to identify and eliminate untruths and falsehoods, thus bring us closer to the truths behind our inquiries. Falsifiability builds on that principle and forms the basis of an important inquiry process, which is hypothesis testing. And we do know that falsifiability was championed by Sir Karl Popper, an influential 20th century philosopher of science, thought that the fundamental feature of a scientific theory is that it should be falsifiable. To call a theory falsifiable is not to say that it's false. Rather, it means that the theory makes some definite predictions which are capable of being tested against experience. If these predictions turn out to be wrong, then the theory has been falsified. Or disproved. We're going to look at the relationship between falsifiability and hypothesis testing in this video. Popper developed his theory partly in response to concerns he had about Freudians and Marxists and the way that everything could be interpreted as supporting their ideas. Chalmers wrote, Popper became suspicious of the way in which he saw Freudians and Marxists supporting their theories by interpreting a wide range of instances of human behaviour or historical change, respectively, in terms of their theory and claiming them to be supported on this account. It seemed to Popper that these theories could never go wrong because they were sufficiently flexible to accommodate any instances of human behaviour or historic change as compatible with their theory. Consequently, Although giving the appearance of being powerful theories confirmed by a wide range of facts, they could in fact explain nothing because they could rule out nothing. Whilst not everything agrees with the principle of falsification, falsification has impacted on two key aspects of science. Firstly, differentiating scientific ideas from non-scientific ideas, which you might also see described as the difference between science and pseudoscience. And also, and very importantly, a method to test and verify scientific ideas. Perhaps it's taken us five videos in, but we're starting to approach an understanding of what the scientific method is 
at last. So then, to test the hypothesis, a controlled experiment must be conducted and the data generated in that experiment analyzed. So if we're going to do this with our hypotheses, then we have to respect two important features. Firstly, hypotheses cannot be proven to be true. This is one of the big mistakes that a lot of high school science students uh, make when they're writing their scientific reports. They say, therefore, my hypothesis is true. One of the things that we must accept is that hypotheses can be falsified, and this is basically related to the falsification principle. And if they are falsified, then those hypotheses can be rejected. That is, they don't support the evidence. We have effectively falsified the hypothesis. But the alternative is not that they have been proven correct, but that we do not reject or we don't have sufficient evidence to reject the hypothesis. It may well be that we consider the evidence that actually has been gathered supports the hypothesis. And we could use the term supports the hypothesis. What we can't do is conclude that the hypothesis has been proven true. It may appear to be an issue of semantics, but it's a very important scientific distinction. Falsification has given rise to a method of testing and verifying scientific ideas known as hypothesis testing. Hypotheses are tentative explanations of a narrow set of related phenomena. Consider the hypothesis particulate pollution in the atmosphere increases the incidence of asthma. This hypothesis proposes an explanation for the increased incidence of asthma. It's a tentative explanation based on observations. It links a cause with a perceived effect, but it needs to be verified. In other words, our hypothesis needs to be tested. When we test our hypotheses, controlled experiments are critical. And we've talked and we will continue to talk more about the importance of not just a control, which is a specific set of conditions, but controlled variables, which is basically all of the things that we think could have an impact on our hypothesis that we don't want to creep into our experiment. Therefore, we want to control them so that we know that if anything changes, those are not the factors that have contributed to that change. Hence, the goal of hypothesis testing is to reject what is false, that is, what is not supported by the evidence. Hypotheses are linked to the scientific method, or probably more correctly, to the scientific purpose or practice. We still haven't really tied down what, if anything, a scientific method actually is. These ideas do harken back to the nature of scientific knowledge, and hence they have that epistemological perspective. In his classic work, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, Popper wrote, these considerations are important for the epistemological theory of experiment. The theoretician puts certain definite questions to the experimenter, and the latter, by his experiments, tries to elicit a decisive answer to these questions and to know others. The principle of falsifiability imparts rigidity to the construction and the use of hypotheses in science. Hypotheses are deductive as opposed to inductive. Hypothesis testing is also referred to as a hypothetico-deductive approach. Hypotheses are operative statements used to design, conduct, and evaluate scientific inquiries. And this is one of the reasons why we've been very critical of the way that students may have expressed their hypotheses in the past. They need to be very clear statements, generally predictive statements, that involve a cause and an effect. If we change this, this will happen. That is often the form of our hypotheses. So well-framed hypotheses possess the following qualities. They're testable either in experiments or verifiable through some sort of observations. They're predictive. They have a particular set of outcomes in mind if certain conditions are met. And they can be explanatory. For example, they are based on some sort of sound scientific concept or theory. They're not just random ideas. This, I guess, is another reason why we can often mistake hypotheses where we think that it's just an educated guess, which has basically been our definition of hypotheses. And whilst that's true, there's a little bit more to it than that. So we just need to make sure that we think about these and, and tick them off. Are they testable? Are they predictive? Are they explanatory? So what about falsifiability and scientific research? After all, we need to be able to link these together. So if we're going to apply falsifiability to hypothesis testing, then inquiries must contain three very important elements. Firstly, 
we must generate a scientific hypothesis. With that hypothesis in mind, we need to develop a method for falsifying or potentially rejecting that scientific hypothesis. And we also need to develop a method for accepting the scientific hypothesis. Now, a good experimental design will cover both two and three. It won't necessarily prove anything is true, but it will give us an idea that either confirms what we suspect or allows us to identify that in fact what we think is not the case and therefore we can falsify that. The scientific hypothesis is generated from scientific theories, laws and paradigms. The following steps are followed to either reject or accept the hypothesis. The null hypothesis falsifies the scientific hypothesis. So it's always written in negative language. So if our scientific hypothesis is changing A causes a certain effect in B, then our null hypothesis is changing A has no effect on B. The alternate hypothesis falsifies the null hypothesis and is similar to the original scientific hypothesis. And we're going to start looking when we do statistical testing a little bit later in this course at two different types of hypotheses. Our null hypothesis, which basically means that nothing's happened, there's been no change, there is no effect. And the alternative hypothesis, well, there is an effect. And let's see which one of those we can uh, find evidence to support or to reject. So then what is a null hypothesis? Godfrey Smith described the null hypothesis as a term with several meanings. It can mean the hypothesis that nothing much is going on. Null as in nothing. But in other cases, the null is said to be the hypothesis that we just want to make sure we don't wrongly reject. The hypothesis we want to be sure we won't reject in a situation where it is true. This precautionary principle, which is often invoked in discussions of environmental and health policy. Put simply, the null hypothesis is usually stated in the form A does not affect B. And this contrasts with the alternative scientific hypothesis, which is that A does affect B. Now, one of the reasons we form null hypotheses is that only the null hypothesis is subject to statistical tests. This means that we do not merely need to collect quality data, we also need to determine how we analyze the data to ensure that we can accept or reject our hypothesis on legitimate grounds. After analyzing our data with the relevant statistical tests, we'll either accept or reject our null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is rejected, then the alternative hypothesis must be accepted. This then supports the original scientific position. Conversely, acceptance of the null hypothesis invalidates the alternative and, as a consequence, the original scientific hypothesis. In this manner, falsifiability enables scientists to get closer to the truth of their discoveries by rejecting that which is false or which cannot be substantiated. So what then should we say about the critics of falsifiability? Well, the falsifiability approach of Popper depicts a clean delineation between falsifiable ideas and those that are not. Falsifiable ideas are considered to be scientific, while other ideas are not scientific. Since the basic tenets of intelligent design and astrology cannot be falsified, these areas are not regarded as being science. Falsifiability provides a characteristic of scientific knowledge. However, in many areas of scientific research, falsifiability is not always possible, and in some respects, astrology itself has falsifiable aspects. Some of the scientific ideas that are being developed, particularly those in physics, for example, are so complex or so new that it's just not possible to falsify them during experiments and observations. One example is the theory of general relativity, which was only validated many years after the theory was published. Another example, Peter Higgs and his colleagues proposed the existence of the Higgs boson in 1964, but this was only experimentally verified by scientists at CERN in 2012. Therefore, even though these ideas were not falsifiable when they were initially proposed, they were subsequently validated through scientifically generated data. This suggests that there might be a grey area where the principle of falsifiability may not apply to all scientific ideas. Disciplines such as evolutionary biology, geology and astronomy contain ideas that are scientific 
but really are not falsifiable. Popper himself initially rejected Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, but later reversed his position, even incorporating Darwin's survival of the fittest concept to his analysis of preferred theories. He wrote, We choose the theory which best holds its own in competition with other theories, the one which, by natural selection, proves itself the fittest to survive. This will be the one which not only has hitherto stood up to the severest tests, but the one which is also testable in the most rigorous way. Michael Matthews is a little bit of a critic in this area. He's produced a number of different works, including the role of history and philosophy in science. And um, he's quite critical of some of the ways in which falsification is used to argue this position of what is scientifically valid. He's particularly critical of the creation of auxiliary hypotheses to rescue theories which were apparently refuted by the evidence, providing these hypotheses were not ad hoc. And in his work, Popper regularly refers to these this idea of auxiliary hypotheses. Matthews specifically cites Galileo's analysis of pendulum motion to support his particular argument. Matthews wrote, just about any experimental situation taken at face value would falsify Galileo's account but he plainly does not rectify his theory in the light of such outcomes. Clearly, even now we've come to the importance of scientific hypotheses and the formation of null hypotheses that allow us to design experiments that are based on falsification, we still haven't quite solved the problem of what science is. But stay with us, and hopefully we will soon. Thanks for watching.